Good day, ladies and gentlemen. ETVT 4.0 will be on the analysis of COVID-19 pandemic. We are looking at selected scenarios in Uganda, and we are asking the following question. What could have been done to improve the One Health approach during the mitigation of the COVID-19 pandemic, especially in Uganda? The SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19 disease has continued to evolve since it first came to being in 2020. We have seen the Alpha variant, which is very prominent in the UK in around April 2020. We saw the Delta variant that was very prominent in India around 2021, and now we are living with the Omicron variant. The response plans rolled out by the public health sector, which is in charge of mitigation of the pandemic, in collaboration with other sectors, has also continued to change. We started with staying at home, quarantine or lockdown. We moved to wearing masks and sanitizing and washing our hands regularly and now we have got vaccines in place. This presentation highlights the impacts on a few issues that were of great concern to the community during the pandemic when there was a surge of cases. These issues include health, and vaccination, confinement at home or total lockdown, decrease of physical economic activity, disruption of education schedules, disruption of supply chains, and the lowered food security. We are asking ourselves the question, how can future responses to such pandemics be tailored along the multidisciplinary and multisectoral approach so as to mitigate the ill effects of such pandemics in the community? So the spread of the COVID virus globally was at its peak in March 2020 and many countries went into lockdown or quarantine to slow the spread of this new virus. Now, this was very good for the, um, from the point of view of controlling of the pandemic because the spread of the disease was slowed down tremendously. Here at home, there's a presidential directive one, to close schools. Two, to suspend large gatherings. This included those in churches, at parties. Shopping malls were to close. And generally, the public were to stay at home except the essential workers, who are mainly the health care workers and the security that was helping them. So this was a very good measure because it slowed down the spread of the virus. However, for every issue, there's both an advantage and a disadvantage. So staying at home, minimizing moving about and transportation caused a disruption in the supply chain. Let's look at the farming sector. Cows are milked in the morning and afternoon. The farmers had nowhere to take the milk. They just poured it. That farmer had to bury large numbers of birds. He couldn't get access to technical help. Maybe the doctor was in another village and inter-district travel was limited. Or he was staring far away and he couldn't access the farm. Supervisors also couldn't access the farm. Maybe they were staying far away. Workers who were working in the poultry houses couldn't access the farm. 
the farmer couldn't access medicines which could have been or vaccines which, which could have been in the ne next town it was difficult for produce to get to the markets well later the agriculture sector and animal sector had many of their technical staff join the essential workers so this was mitigated but such incidences can lead to loss in income and also food insecurity. Let's look at the disruption of supply chain in the health sector. Just a few cases. It was difficult to access health centers and many home care based workers who had their clients in the community found it difficult to access these clients. Now let's look at this picture. This lady had to access the health center. I think she had a broken leg. This was taken in Arua by the Monitor newspaper. So she was innovative. She got someone on a wheelbarrow to take her to hospital. This gentleman had to take his child to hospital. He was going to use a bicycle. And the only way he could move with the bicycle and the child was to strap the child on the back, which is very rare. It's usually ladies we see with children strapped on the back. Okay, so many health programs and outreaches were put on hold indefinitely at the beginning of the pandemic, like vaccination drives, TB clinics, HIV clinics, diabetics clinics. Now, such a situation can possibly lead to increase in mortalities from other conditions other than COVID-19. Let's look at the disruption of the supply chain in the transport sector. Freight trucks began to pile at the border between the Kenya and Uganda. And this was because the truck drivers had to undergo rigorous PCR COVID health checks. And they didn't like the procedure. Many times they were not very cooperative and this just lengthened the whole time the health checks had to take place. So as a result, goods and services that were going to the endpoint users were delayed, be it industries, be it wholesalers. Now let's look at another impact of um, the pandemic, the health in the community. Mental health was affected by the stay at home order. There were increased cases of domestic violence. People were staying with people they were not used to spending a long time with. The whole morning, the whole afternoon, the whole evening, night, the next day, the whole cycle is repeated again. So tempers were on the edge and domestic violence was seen. And unfortunately, Many of the victims had to stay and shelter in place with the perpetrators. We also saw a number of uh, child abuse cases increasing. And there was a lot of stress in the community. So the cases of mental disorders increased. Stress was caused either because of loss of job, loss of income, uncertainty. You don't know when you're going to go back to work. The children didn't know when they were going to go back to school. Um, it was lonely sheltering place for the old ones. So the cases of depression and mental disorders increased. The impact of the pandemic on the health, on the resilience of the health systems, our health system was overwhelmed and not only ours, but worldwide, the health systems were overwhelmed. There were shortages of hospital beds, shortages of supply for the intensive care units, be it oxygen or ventilators, shortages of strained workers to work in the intensive care units, shortages in protective clothing for the healthcare workers, and the medical workers themselves succumbed to COVID. Education schedules were disrupted. Worldwide, it was believed the schools were 
going to be amplifiers of the virus. So physical teaching was halted, schools were closed, and virtual teaching was encouraged. Now, when we look at that picture, taken in the rural area, that child is trying to get a lesson virtually by radio. Sitting on a chair doesn't even have a desk and writing on their laps and the child is not supervised. So we see that the rural communities from the start were disadvantaged by the virtual or online learning and the learners with special needs were not catered for. Whereas the town counterparts were able to use Zoom, online and computers with simulations. So there was lots of school time and up to now we're wondering whether the structures in place will enable learners catch up with the lost time. We shall get to know later when they do the national exams. Another situation that came up were pregnancies, teenage pregnancies. This increased during the periods when the schools were locked down. We've got to see that schools were safe havens where the teenage daughters of ours could spend their time away from the perpetrators. But now that they were in the same households with the perpetrators, many of them got pregnant. And there was also an increase in cases of child abuse because the children were not staying at the schools again, which were safe havens. Now, that's a picture of a child vending eggs. And during the lockdown, there was an increase in child labor. At the junctions of the traffic lights, we began seeing children vending food items, vegetables, masks. And there was also general loss of employment, which came about when the schools were closed. These schools were employing administrators, casual workers, cooks, nurses, you name it. And they all lost their employment. Now, even after the schools have been opened, it's unfortunate that not all learners have been able to return. The last case that we're going to look at is vaccine hesitancy and social media anti-vax misinformation. In Uganda, vaccination was kicked off in March 2021. And there we see a lucky journalist who was covering the event get a vaccine shot. But Africa doesn't produce its own vaccines and relies on supplies from COVAX and other donor countries. So Africa has been late in receiving the vaccine doses. While the, de while the developed countries are getting booster shots or the third shots for COVID-19 in Africa, most of us are still getting the first doses. And there's been a lot of hesitancy to embrace the COVID vaccines, which are new, the DNA vaccines or mRNA vaccines, which are quite new, and the public has been hesitant to pick them on. Now, this has been fueled by misinformation that's circulating on social media, which the community is bombarded with day in and day out from the TV, the mobile phones, and the general talk. So at this case, we are wondering, what could have been done better to improve the One Health approach during the mitigation of the COVID-19 pandemic in Uganda? We are going to discuss this on our discussion forums. Thank you.